today. Really appreciate it. Hi. Hi, uh, my beer. Thank you for having me. Yes, I am a neurointerventionist. I'm going to emphasize that part, but thank you for having me. Happy to help. And I am also a diagnostic radiology professor at the University of Miami on a remote capacity. So take it away. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So first, we're going to start off with a little poll. If everyone can log in at polleb.com forward slash Mumbir Sandu 564 um, and just let us know where you're logging in from. All right, looks like we have a good mix of areas. Um, all right, so next slide, please. All right, our second question, um, where are you in your medical career? So I guess we've got a lot of medical students here today and in attending. And we can move on to the meeting itinerary. So just going over what we're gonna talk about today. First, we're gonna go over some anatomy, epidemiology, then pathophysiology, clinical presentation, diagnostic workup, medical and surgical treatment options, IR treatment options, and post-procedure management. And then we're gonna discuss our paper. So first we're gonna brush up a little bit of our anatomy. So here we have um, a few figures depicting types of pleura. Does anyone from the audience want to take a guess at the names of these types of pleura? And you guys can just unmute and just say number one is, number two is, number three, well, all the way up to eight, um, or you can just type in the chat. Yep, you're right. Three is visceral pleura and four is parietal. And um, similar for one and two, one is parietal pleura, two is visceral. And we have the answers to see right there. And next slide, please. All right, next we have figure with lung field borders. Anyone want to take a guess at the names of these orders? Okay. 
two of them are costal. I think we can just review the answers. All right. And our final one, we have um, recesses of lung fields. So number one is our costal mediastinal recess. And number two is our costal diaphragmatic. We have another question. Yeah, that's basically it. Yep. All right, so we can check the claustrophonic angle for blunting um, in order to check for our pleural effusions. All right, so going into the epidemiology, we have um, pleural infections, which include Pleural empyema or a complicated paraneumonic effusion. These develop when fluid in the pleural effusion is infected. And according to our paper, we have an annual incidence of more than 65,000 cases in the US and the UK with a mortality rate of between 10 to 20 percent. And unfortunately, drainage through chest tube and administration of antibiotics fails in roughly a third of patients. Risk factors include aspiration, poor dental hygiene, malnutrition, and drug abuse. And moving on to pathophysiology, we have a few stages of paraneumonic effusions. In stage one, we have our simple paraneumonic effusion with free-flowing sterile um, exudated fluid. And in stage two, we have our complicated paraneumonic effusion and MPEMA. So here we have um, effusion that has become infected and possibly with frank pus in the case of empyema. And we'll have fibrin deposition and loculations within the pleural space, as well as exudative effusion with high white cell count. And stage three, we have our chronic organization of pleural fluid. Um, and here we can develop a fibrous peel that will encase the lung and hinder re-expansion, causing what we call a trapped lung. And this can form into a true scar, which is not good. Next slide, please. All right, so clinically, um, pleural infections can present as decreased vocal formatus and breath sounds. And compared to pneumonia alone, there will be a longer duration of symptoms. However, many of the signs and symptoms will overlap with pneumonia. So you have to look out for patients who have risk factors specifically for MPE, including persistent or new fever and a lack of clinical response to antibiotics. Next slide, please. All right, so diagnostic workup includes a lot of radiographic imaging, um, including chest x-ray, ultrasound, and CT. Um, for chest x-rays, they should really be ordered on all patients with pneumonia to assess for pleural fluid. And um, if we go to the next slide, we'll have a, an example of a chest radiograph showing loculated right paranormal effusion. And so um, on the chest x-ray, we want to check the claustrophonic angles that we mentioned earlier for any blunting. We can also check for a meniscus sign. And um, the reason why um, we would want to use the other imaging methods, though, however, is because um, in around 10% of cases, like the pleural effusions will be missed due to possibly like consolidation or other factors like covering the effusion. So move on to ultrasound, which is um, used to evaluate effusion and feasibility of sampling or drainage through presentesis. And um, fluid will be collected, which can be analyzed for cell count and microbiome, etc. And on the next slide, we'll have an example of an ultrasound with a large pleural effusion here. And um, you can see that the 
fluid is in the anechoic region in the middle. And far field, we have, you know, the heart and the diagram, the diaphragm. And um, so typically the ultrasound will be performed at bedside and used to guide the needle or catheter placement for thoracentesis. And as you can see here with the pleural effusion, oh, yes, um, the lung will be like compressed because of the fluid. All right, so for CTs, um, these are the most sensitive methods and able to detect small amounts of fluid. Um, on the next slide, we'll have an example of a uh, CT chest showing loculated little effusion indicated by the arrows. Um, like I said earlier, this is the most sensitive method for detecting small amounts of little fluid. Um, and in order to appreciate like the loculations, um, you can also appreciate any underlying airway or any oral abnormalities or things like that. And um, loculations you can typically see as tapered borders and obtuse angles between the fluid and the chest wall with absence of meniscus sign. Whereas for empyema, um, there'll be an associated thickening of the visceral and parietal pleura. Next slide, please. Um, for medical and surgical treatment options, for uncomplicated paranormal effusion, they often resolve by themselves um, with the antibiotic therapy. Um, so no drainage required, and you would repeat imaging and perform sampling if um, the patient's like non-responsive to the therapy. For complicated paranormal effusion and empyema, um, the drainage is indicated in most cases. Um, in certain cases, such as if the uh, pH is lower than 7.2 or glucose um, lower than 40 milligrams per deciliter, um, it's predictive for the tube throughout the thoracostomy. Um, chest tube drainage is required in cases of emphyema, and um, a rapid score can be used, which takes into account renal failure, age, purulence, infective, infectious score, and dietary factors in order to um, stratify the patient's risk of mortality. For IR treatment options, we have thoracentesis, which is typically performed under ultrasound guidance. Um, in most cases, they're at least sampled um, diagnostically. Um, therapeutically, it can also be used to provide some symptomatic relief. Post-procedure, um, like I said earlier, the uncomplicated perineumonic effusions um, will resolve um, within maybe one to two weeks. Complicated perineumonic effusions will take around two to three weeks, whereas MPEMA will take around four to six weeks. Um, complete radiographic resolution will take a lot longer, so um, it's not really necessary to treat until you see complete radiographic resolution. And IV antibiotics can be switched to oral when the patient is clinically improving and hemodynamically stable. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and here we have a cute little figure from osmosis, just going over briefly all the stuff I mentioned earlier about pleural infections. Awesome. Thank you, Melanie. Um, so now we'll stop the share and reshare um, to go into the second part of the presentation. Okay, so um, now we're going to talk about our paper of the month, uh, which is titled Intraplural Use of Tissue Plasminogen Activator and DNAs in Plural Infection by Raman et al. Uh, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2011. Next slide, please. Um, so now with the background and purpose uh, of the MIST-1 and MIST-2 trial, um, so standard therapy is usually antibiotics and tube range of the infected pleural flu fluid, and that is seen in the bottom left of that cartoon or animated image that we have at, on the screen. And 
Um, in, however, in severe cases of pleural infection, uh, surgery is often required and uh, severe cases of pleural infection are uh, usually when there's uncontrolled levels of infected fl uh, fluid with or without sepsis. And we see that in the image um, on the bottom right hand side of the slide. Next slide, please. Um, so the initial belief was that um, in theory, um, suggested by observational data, the thought was interpleural administration of fibrinolytic drugs would reduce the frequency of failed drainage and subsequent need for surgery. And this would work by cleaving intrapleural fibrinous septations and improving chest tube drainage. Um, however, unfortunately, that was not observed in the large first multicenter intrapleural sepsis trial, otherwise known as MIST-1, uh, that was published in 2005. Um, they found uh, or otherwise concluded that there was no benefit of intrapleural streptokinase. Um, and this was further supported by meta-analysis in the following year, 2006, labeled intrapleural fibrinolytic agents for empyema and complicated parent mnemonic effusions. And on the next slide, we just see a title of that um, that meta-analysis in case any uh, one of you would like to go ahead and on your own time and read more about uh, that meta-analysis. But however, um, going on to the next slide, there was still strong clinical and scientific support for the hypothesis that the division of pleural septations with the use of fibrolytic agents would result in improved uh, pleural drainage. And this came uh, with this editor editorial um, in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2006. Um, it specifically rejected the notion that we should avoid intrapleural use of fibrinolytic therapy, and it brought up a few shortcomings of the MIST-1 trial, such as the study's uh, kind of broad inclusion criteria, lack of proper imaging, advanced age of many of the patients, comorbidities uh, of the patients enrolled in the trial, which later uh, affected the results, as well as the lack of specific standardized protocols. And moving on to the next slide, um, therefore, our paper today that we're talking about, uh, otherwise known as the MIST-2 trial, examined a different direct acting fibrolytic agent, um, TPA, or tissue plasminogen activator. Um, and additionally, they also wanted to uh, try out DNAs or human recombinant DNAs because of the fact that usually in pleural infections or pleural empyema, there is extracellular presence of DNA and possible bacterial components in the pleural space. And this can lead to increased viscosity and greater biofilm formation. Um, so they hypothesized that there could be some benefit for patients suffering with uh, pleural infection or pleural empyema if uh, there was a combined therapy of TPA and DNAs. And in the past, um, interpleural DNAs had been used to treat pleural infections in both animal models and small case series. Next slide, please. So moving on to the methods, uh, the second missed trial was a double blind, double dummy, factorial randomized trial conducted at 11 centers across the United Kingdom from the time frame of 2005 to November 2008. Um, and it was sponsored by the University of Oxford. And um, I don't know um, if you guys remember this um, Boards and Beyond video from your preclinical years or if you're still a first or second year medical student, but uh, this is just a nice slide from Boards and Beyond that just talks about the importance of uh, clinical trials that are randomized, uh, controlled, and blinded, and how often they take a long time and they require a lot of uh, financial support, but uh, sometimes new treatments do emerge from randomized clinical trials. Um, so we can move on to the eligibility criteria on the next slide. So uh, for the MIST-2 trial, um, how did they deem um, which patients could be enrolled in the trial? So um, essentially the eligibility criteria was clinical evidence of infected pleural fluid, um, and this would uh, count as macroscopic purulence, positive bacteria culture, positive gram staining, a pH that was acidic, otherwise less than 7.2, along with fever and elevated serum level, uh, serum levels of inflammatory markers such as C-reactive protein and an elevated white blood cell count. Next slide, please. Um, and then the exclusion criteria for the MIST-2 trial 
Um, otherwise, uh, how did they know which patients not to enroll in the trial? Um, they deemed the following criteria as excluding factors. So if the patient was less than 18 years old, if they had prior treatment with um, intrapleural fibrolytic agents, DNAs, or both uh, for a current or past empyema, known sensitivity to either DNAs or TPA, coincidental stroke, major hemorrhage trauma, major surgery in the past five days, previous hemonectomy on the infected side, uh, if the patient was pregnant or lactating, or if they had less than a three month expected survival period due to a pathological condition other than what was responsible for their uh, pleural empyema. So we can move on to the next slide and look at um, how the patients were randomized uh, in the MIST-2 trial. So the patients were randomized into four groups via minimization. And that minimization criteria was the presence of pleural fluid, uh, presence of hospital or community-acquired infection, uh, as well as pleural collection that occupied 30% or less of the total hemithorax on initial chest x-ray. Um, and on the next slide, we'll be able to see uh, what the four groups were for the MIST-2 trial. So group one was the double placebo. Group two was the combined uh, TPA and DNA therapy. Group three was just the TPA alone, and group four was the DNAs alone. Um, and the intrapleural medication was given two times daily for the first three days, and the dose of DNAs was five milligrams, whereas the dose of TPA was 10 milligrams. And following administration, the drain was clamped for one hour, which allowed the study drugs to remain in the pleural space and um, essentially work to their best ability while the tube was still clamped. So on the next slide, we can see the primary endpoints of the MIST-2 trial. So this would be the change in area of pleural opacity uh, defined as a, a percentage of ipsilateral hemithorax occupied by effusion on chest X-ray from day seven to day, or sorry, day one to day seven, as well as the area of pleural opacity plus area of ipsilateral hemithorax measured digitally. And validation studies showed measurement strategy predicted 71% of the exact change in the volume of uh, pleural fluid collection. And this was quantified by multi-slice thoracic CT. And on the next slide, we can see a figure uh, from the paper. And this is figure one. Um, it's labeled study measurements on digital chest radiograph. So in panel A, we have the all of the hemithorax uh, delineated in blue. Um, and this was measured on both day one and day seven, but it's only shown once over here. And then in panel B, we had the plural opacity shown on baseline um, in day one. And then in panel C, we have the plural opacity shown on day seven. And the percentage of hemithorax area occupied by the plural opacity on day one was calculated as the colored area in panel B divided by the area in panel A multiplied by 100. And similarly, the uh, plural opacity percentage uh, calculated for day seven was done with panel C divided by panel A multiplied by 100. Um, and the change in percentage of hemithorax occupied by pleural opacity, which was the primary outcome between day seven and day one, uh, is 37 or 31% in the example given here. And on the next slide, we can just see all uh, what we just discussed on the previous slide, but just written out in the figure one description. So um, on the following slide, um, we have the secondary endpoints of the MIST-2 trials uh, listed uh, in front of us. So that would be the change in area of pleural opacity of chest X-ray as a percent reduction from baseline area, uh, proportion of patients referred for thoracic surgery by three months and 12 months, duration of hospital stay between randomization and discharge, volume of pleural fluid drain between randomization and day seven, and change in inflammatory markers, which were uh, the white blood cell count, C-reactive protein level, and presence or absence of fever, um, as well as death from any cause by three, three months or by 12 months, and frequency of serious and non-serious adverse events during the study. So we now have the statistical analysis of the MIST-2 trial. Um, so continuous outcomes were analyzed by linear regression models, binary outcomes were analyzed by logistic regression models, and inflammatory markers were analyzed longitudinally by mixed effects models. And the study was powered, um, otherwise um, known as like how many people they should enroll or how many patients they should enroll in the study, 
uh, whether intracleural TPA or DNA therapy could increase proportion of patients who had 50% reduction in area of opacity from 50% of patients to 70% of patients. And the calculations that they ran showed that the MIS-2 trial would need a total of 210 patients in four randomly assigned equal number groups. And on the next slide, we can see table one. Um, and on table one, we see that um, essentially this table uh, just serves to show how the there were a total of 210 patients enrolled and split into four groups, 52 in the TPA only, um, 51 in DNAs only, 52 in the combined TPA and DNA therapy, as well as 55 in the double placebo. Uh, six of the patients did not receive medication, and 11 had baseline pleural opacity, which occupied less than 5% of the hemithorax on chest x-ray. So therefore, the primary analysis was only of 193 patients. But the rest of this uh, table right here just goes to show that the baseline demographic, clinical, and microbiological characteristics of patients were similar across all four groups. And now for the uh, actual results or the primary major secondary outcomes, according to the study group, on this slide, we have it in table two. Um, next slide, please, Molly. Thank you. Um, so here we have, um, at, on the left-hand side, we have the change from baseline in hemithorax area occupied by fusion in percentage, and this was the primary outcome. So we can see we have the TPA only group, DNAs only, TPA and DNAs combined therapy, and then the double placebo group. Um, so the difference in mean change in pleural opacity from day one to day seven between the TPA DNAs group and the placebo group was clinically and statistically significant with a uh, negative 7.9% change with a p-value of 0.005. Um, and we can also see that there was no significant improvement in primary outcome with either TPA or DNAs alone compared to the double placebo group. So um, just to sum up that first part, we do see a clinical and statistically significant um, change in plural opacity with the negative 7.9 with the p-value of 0 0.005 in the TPA and DNAs combined therapy whereas in the TPA alone or DNAs alone, we did not see any significant difference or any effectiveness. Uh, moving on to the uh, second row uh, or the surgical referral, uh, we can see in the TPA DNAs group, the frequency of surgical referral at three months was lower than in the placebo group. 4% uh, of patients in the TPA DNAs group as compared to 16% of patients in the double placebo group. Um, as seen um, on, I don't know, Melanie, could you just like use the red pointer and just like circle the column underneath TPA DNAs, just where it says like the 0 0.03. Uh, otherwise it's fine. Okay. It's okay. Um, moving on. So duration of hospital stay in DNAs and TPA only groups were similar in length in to the placebo group, whereas in the TPA DNAs combo group, hospitalizations were significantly shorter with a p-value of less than 0 0.001. And then not shown in table two, uh, but mortality rates were similar among all four groups at both three months and 12 months. And then on the next slide, we have figure two um, from our paper. Um, and essentially, we have on the y-axis the change in size of baseline plural shadowing in percent. And on the x-axis, we have treatment group. Um, and uh, again, you can see the double placebo, then the TPA only, then the DNAs only, and then the combined TPA DNAs uh, therapy. And you can see at the top of the figure uh, with the p-value of 0 0.005, there was a statistical significance in the TPA DNAs group, whereas in the DNAs only as well as TPA only, uh, there was no si significance or statistical significance. And um, each circle represents an individual patient and the mean changes are indicated by the horizontal bars. So uh, moving on to the next table, um, Table three, um, this table essentially just goes to show that um, in adverse events, both serious and non-serious, uh, they were evenly distributed across the trial group. So, um, and we see that here. And in the first uh, row serious, um, the p-value was calculated by Fisher's exact test. 
and the non-series was calculated by a chi-square test. And moving on to our uh, second to last slide, the discussion. So some of the take home points that I want uh, to echo again, um, so uh, we can just cover that up and wrap up the presentation. So the combined TPA and DNA treatment led to improved drainage of infected fluid while having no increased association of adverse events. Along with the improved drainage, the combination of TPA and DNAs led to 77% fewer referrals for thoracic surgery and a 6.7 day reduction in hospital stay. Um, and then when we had only the TPA or DNAs alone, uh, we saw that they were ineffective in improving drainage. And this supported the data from the 2005 MIS-1 trial. Um, there's not really an exact explanation for why fibrinolytic agents alone do not appear to be helpful in treating patients with extensive fibrin deposition in the pool space. Uh, but this suggests that the free DNA cleavage is necessary to reduce fluid viscosity and allow for fibrinolytic drugs to work well and clear the pleural space. Um, and the data from this MIS-2 trial suggests that TPA plus the additional cleavage of uncoiled DNA with the help of DNAs allowed for fibrolytic treatment to be effective. Uh, the authors of this paper also cited studies in vitro and animal model of pleural infection, which show and support these findings. And um, as seen in table two, uh, sorry, I forgot, forgot to mention that in table two, but um, in DNAs alone, uh, it was not only ineffective um, in showing uh, improved drainage, but uh, if you, sorry, Melian, do you see where it says 18 out of 46? Or could you just like circle that with your mouse? Yeah, so thank you. So in that part, um, not only was it ineffective in improving drainage, but it actually um, showed an increase in surgical referrals by a factor of three. And the authors believe this to be a result of systemic absorption of bacterial and other infl inflammatory components after the biofilm in the pleural space was disrupted by DNA's administration. And since there was no uh, fluid drainage benefit with an added uh, fibrolytic agent in the, that DNA's only group, all of that was absorbed um, in the surrounding tissue, um, which is possibly what led to the increased um, need for thoracic surgery because the clinical picture of the patient rapidly deteriorated in uh, that group. So uh, basically just the take home point for DNAs only uh, therapy or monotherapy with DNAs, uh, that should be avoided um, and not used in patients with pool infection or empyema. Um, and then we can go back to the last, or we can go back to the discussion side, please. Um, so basically just to sum it up um, in like two sentences, um, Interpleural use of TPA and DNA's combined therapy improved fluid drainage in patients with pleural empyema, reduced frequency of surgical referral, and reduced duration of hospital stay. Um, and then the last uh, few sentences of my conclusion would be treatment of DNAs alone or TPA alone were ineffective um, and not superior compared to TPA combined with DNA's therapy. And yeah, that pretty much wraps it up. Does anybody have any questions for us or Dr. Lozano? I have to type it in. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Um, so thank you very much for that very nice presentation to both of you. I have a question. This study was um, published in 2011, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and since this is a UK study, what is the, do you know, or did you read upon the current state of guidelines in the US related to treatment of pyramonic effusions? Are we using these compounds upfront? Is it more of a rescue therapy? Is it the standard of care or what has happened since publication of this study, at least in the US, if you know that, that'll be, that'll be my question for now. Thank you. Yes, that is a great question, Dr. Lozano. Um, I actually did not do any further reading apart from checking up to date a few, uh, like 30 minutes before presenting, um, or I had checked it prior, but I remember just reading it 30 minutes ago and up to date, uh, but it did mention that um, like standard therapy is TPA plus DNAs, but 
I'm, this is coming from a very limited perspective of a first year medical student. So if anybody else would like to jump in and help me out with this answer, if anybody uh, has firsthand experience in treating uh, paranemonic effusions or complicated uh, pleural empyemas, please feel free to add to that. But I can read up more on that um, in case nobody has additional answer. There's a, a question in the chat, Dr. Lozano, if you uh, if you can uh, answer that. I don't know if you could see it. Okay, I think Riley is asking, do you know if other studies have combined DNAs with other probinolytic classes and found similar results? Let's see. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't see... Yeah. I don't see the question on the chat. I must have missed it. But anyway, I, I do not know of any other studies as I sort of did the disclaimer at the beginning. I'm not a body eye or doc. I'm a neurointerventionalist, but I'm more than happy to chime in. I know that uh, TPA or similar agents like streptokinase and fibrinolytics have been used since the 40s, 1940s, with the mixed results. And then we had the results that Mambu discussed regarding the MIST-1 trial where it was just one fibrinolytic agent. And then I guess uh, over the past several decades, they started implementing other compounds like the DNA is. But I don't know that there are any other additional compounds per se used in the plural space for the purposes of lighting adhesions or draining or aiding in the drainage of loctated paranoid plural effusions. I think that's it. What I do know, and that's perhaps what I was asking to Manbir is, is, is that it's used in common practice, I just don't have the experience or the know-how if it's standard of care here in the U.S. or if it's a rescue therapy when initial um, upfront treatment such as drainage and antibiotics is not working. Um, but that, I don't know. So I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for your specific question. This is uh, Joji. Uh, yeah, at our place, uh, we'll, uh, we'll do it kind of as rescue. So we'll put the chest tube in for a complex of black ray diffusion. And then we'll uh, kind of take out no more than a liter in four hours clamp, so on and so forth. And then if it stops and there's still persistent effusion on that radiograph, then we'll um, well, then we'll do the Dornace and TPA, uh, lock it for like four hours and unclamp the chest tube. So we'll do five milligrams and then the 10 into 50 mLs, we'll infuse it, we'll trap it, and then we'll release it. And then sometimes that'll put the... Uh, the external flow. So basically, it's going to prevent travel lung. Great. So it sounds as more as, as you were indicating, it sounds more of a, if not a rescue, <laughs> at least a follow up of the initial non fibrinolytic DNA therapy. Exactly. Self maybe 24 hours, and also direct evaluation of how the the fluid evacuation is responding. I guess if it's really not much is coming out, then goes an x-ray, and if it's not really working or the patient is deteriorating 24 hours, perhaps just bring out the guns with the... That's what I'm yeah, that's, yeah, that's what we do at least, that are one site, so... Great. All right. Good to know. Thank you. Hi, Dr. V. Um, I was wondering if do you um attempt like TPA DNA spur or um is it mostly just for like non-surgical candidates that you would attempt no, it? No, 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 we would do it like if there's a I mean if the patient's super sick, then no, but if it's like a paranomotic effusion, it looks loculated, it's very septated on ultrasound, loculated on CAT scan, we'll put the we'll put the tube in 
and you can kind of get an assessment. If it's not draining a lot, then you know that there's that's a patient that uh, it's not free flowing is probably going to need the, the fibrinolytic and Dornase. So you kind of get an assessment as soon as you put the needle in and you'll get an idea because you start to drain some. We don't drain a lot. If it's like the leader's coming out, then you probably don't need these fibrinolytics. But if like 100 mLs or 200 is sitting right in the middle of the collection, then you know that you're probably going to need some help. So you get an idea and assessment based on the imaging and once you put the tube, the chest tube in. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. But it would be interesting, as uh, someone Riley mentioned, would a more fibrin-specific or affinity uh, lytic work better, like TNK versus TPA in this bed? I don't know. That I can chime in because I am a stroke interventionist, and I do manage TNK and TPA. And really, the, the I don't I don't foresee there being an advantage. It's, it's a great question. Maybe there is. Um, the properties that we like TNK using for the stroke scenario is more related to pharmacokinetics systemically, meaning TNK you just give a one shot up front if the patient is eligible for it, whereas TPA systemically at least is an infusion. But I suspect the effect at the end is the same. You're going to activate plasminogen and try to um, to lyse you know, fibrin within that pleural space cavity. I suspect that there won't be much of an outcome difference, but but it's a good question. Who knows? Maybe there is. Uh, the end result would probably be similar in my my estimation, anyway. Thanks. Yeah, so I think it's important to understand just kind of the pleural space and management of, uh, you know, hemothorax, empyema, simple infusions, chylothorax, differentials, and uh, this is just another tool in your armamentarium for managing their mnemonic or empyemas. Dr. Lozano, we had a question for you. Um, why or what specifically got you interested in neuro IR? Oh, wow. <laughs> Changing topics. Okay, sure. <laughs> Thank you for the question. So I'm a. Um... I'm a radiologist by training, but I did have an interest in neuro-related uh, whatever sciences within medicine from an early age, because my mother is a stroke survivor. She had a ruptured aneurysm at age 44. So I wasn't even in, in medical school. I was a high schooler. So that sort of set my path into the medicine field and with an, an idea of something neuro-related. And then once I found myself um, deciding upon residency, I I figured I would go into neuroradiology. As as it's usually is the case, I ended up going to a conference by chance, and it, and the presenter was a neurointerventionist who had trained in Argentina, and I was just in awe with the pictures he was showing of the cerebral vasculature and the various diseases uh, that could be diagnosed and treated um, from a minimally invasive and the vascular approach, including so it happens uh, um, brain aneurysms. So that's what got me into that field. And that's where I am right now. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your insight. Anyone have any last minute questions? All right, I guess I'll ask again. Any 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 limitations or things to improve that perhaps the authors or letters to the authors or you yourselves may have thought of or or may have picked up upon um, when reviewing this study? Or anybody else in the audience who thinks or has a question as to how things may have been done better nowadays, 10, 15 years forward from the publication of this study. It's kind of like the typical questions they ask in journal flow, so I won't take any credit, so. <laughs> All right.
I was actually discussing um, the paper with a few classmates earlier today um, after anatomy lab. Um, and we remember having a lecture um, from one of our radiology professors earlier this year uh, talking about the importance of getting multiple angles uh, for chest x-rays. So uh, we just found it interesting that uh, even though they did, um, it was mentioned in the study that uh, they did use multi-slice CT uh, to confirm um, the shaded areas of pleural opacity. Um, we were hoping to see like more imaging in the study or within the figures, um, because I believe the only imaging that they showed uh, was that panel, uh, the panel A, B, and C that I showed from figure one earlier in this presentation. Um, it would have been nice if they had like a lateral view of the chest x-rays so we could see uh, the back or the posterior portion of the costa diaphragmatic recess to see how much um, plural, infected pleural fluid had accumulated in there uh, on day one. But apart from that, I guess my main point would just be, it would be nice to see more imaging in that paper, but um, maybe it was in like the supplementary section, but that was like another link. Uh, but mostly that was dealing with statistics. Um, I don't know if anybody else has read the paper prior, um, but that was just one thing that I thought about. Um, it would have been nice if they had included more imaging in their figures. Well, I'm going to agree with that comment. Uh, as a radiologist, me too, I was already bumped out. It was only an X-ray. And, and, and you, even at this stage, and most of the audience know how limited an X-ray can be. It's very dependent on patient's position and patient's body habitus, uh, PA versus AP. And then the meniscus sign, or the blunting of the coxophrenic recess, it, it only occurs when you have a sizable pleurofusion too. So if that was their inclusion criteria just based on an x-ray, I'd be surprised. But as Mambir was expanding, it seems like at least it was confirmed on follow-up uh, CT that it was a collection of X, Y, or Z volumes. Uh, but yeah, um, I don't think I have any other questions. So I'm just going to mute myself. And thank you very much to the presenters. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Sano, for being here with us today. Really appreciate it. Any other questions from the audience? This was really great. Thank you guys so much, Munbir and Milani and Dr. Lozana. Thank you guys for being here. And um, this was very educational. I hope everyone found it useful. So um, we will put this uh, recording up on YouTube very soon. And then you guys can refer to it back later. All right, hope to see you guys at the next Journal Club. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. You guys. <laughs>